Hi everybody, my name is Josiah, also known as Chilling Silence, and today I'm going to talk to you about the banking paradigm shift of cryptocurrency. Or, let's not stay stuck in the old ways for the sake of an extra dollar. So, I'm here uh, representing Digibyte, and this is because anybody can represent Digibyte and speak on behalf of a decentralized blockchain. Let's be honest, they probably wouldn't pick me otherwise if they had a choice in the matter. Uh, but I've been involved in cryptocurrencies now for five years, originally as a miner, uh, now as an advocate for decentralization, for integrity, and also as an educator. So today I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey through time, both looking back through history uh, as well as into the future. Uh, you see, many people have only just recently got involved with blockchain and cryptocurrency in the last 12 odd months since the hype set in. That's totally fine too, but because many people found out about this as a way to get rich quick, and they don't really understand the underlying technology uh, as a result. So that's what I wanted to talk to about today. Uh, I want to help you understand the value proposition behind Digibyte, why it's so powerful, and why this is a complete paradigm shift from the old way of thinking. So we hear a lot about cryptocurrency, how it's going to change the way that we use money, how it's now peer-to-peer, -peer, without a bank, without a clearinghouse, or any other kind of a financial institution. So I really want to uh, briefly look to start at what we have today as money. So who's ever used PayPal before? I have, and it sucks. It takes ages for funds to be sent and to be cleared. Recently, PayPal wasn't actually going to release uh, some funds after somebody had sent me the money from overseas. PayPal had basically just decided that I was laundering money and they completely froze it. No reasoning at all. Who's ever tried sending money with uh, SWIFT payments internationally? It also sucks. The fees are horrendous. It's terribly slow. You've often got to have a bunch of information uh, either handed over about yourself or you've got to know a whole lot of details about the other party. Western Union, also not better. Credit cards. Well, we know that chargebacks are a thing. Uh, sometimes even fraudulent chargebacks. I recall for a while it was pretty big on Twitch. Uh, people would donate a large sum of money, several hundred dollars in fact, just to see uh, a Twitch streamer's reaction uh, of them getting excited and things. They would in then issue a chargeback to cancel it so that the streamer never receives a cent. The same thing even happens with physical stores, and it's a case of, oh sorry, the person who walked out of your store with a TV a week ago? Yeah, well that card was reported stolen, so we've gone and we've reversed all of the transactions for last week including the charge for that TV, so good luck getting it back. Or what if your, your wiki leaks and all of a sudden somebody else decides that you shouldn't be getting credit card payments through them? How is that fair, and who made them the judge, the jury, and the executioner? Or even on a personal note, uh, with mining, I wanted to open up a bank account for my cryptocurrency mining, and the banks closed it uh, after a couple of days with no explanation at all. Uh, now, has anybody here seen what's happening in Venezuela with the runaway hyperinflation? This is because somebody else decided that it was a clever idea to print more money. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem fair to me that in the space of a month, the buying power of your currency can drop by over 50% due to the actions of your government. It certainly makes saving nigh on impossible, and so I think we can all agree the traditional money system sucks. Who remembers what happened on a worldwide scale back in 2007 and 2008? No, I'm not talking about the release of the original iPhone in June of 2007, although that was pretty memorable. But back then we had a horrible financial crisis on a global scale. Then, come 2009, Bitcoin is born. And in it, the Genesis block contains the hash of these words. The Times, 3rd of January 2009. Chancellor on the brink of a second bailout for the banks. Now, this was obviously a not-so-subtle dig at the current global financial system. Then in 2014, when Digibyte was created, we included the hash USA Today, 10th of January 2014. Target. Data stolen from up to 110 million customers. Now, this was due to Digibyte's focus uh, on cybersecurity in addition to payments. So... What is Bitcoin designed to do? Bitcoin, and also Digibyte, is designed to put you, the user, in complete control of your funds from beginning to end. It's designed so that you don't need a bank to act as a middleman, nor do you require a government or a reserve bank to print you more currency, nor do you have the need of any kind of a third party to bend the rules or tell you what you can do with your funds or who you should or should not trust. 
Bitcoin and Digibyte work completely without having to trust anybody, not even the person that you are paying. Now you can verify yourself and validate from the beginning to the end every single transaction that has occurred on the blockchain. Think of it like the ability to go back and effectively undo nine years worth of edits on an Excel spreadsheet and then to hit the redo button and to check all of the math and the cryptographic security that goes along with it. You can also confirm for yourself, confirm everything and ensure that it's all legitimate. Now, in addition, this can't be faked. It can't be duplicated. Uh, you can't fool the system. Transactions can't be rolled back like a chargeback, nor can the total supply be messed with and additional currency printed. You see, everybody agrees that there will be 21 million Bitcoin, 21 billion Digibyte, and that's that. Lastly, but potentially most importantly, nobody can kick you off the network or prevent you from using it. There's no top dog who decides who can or cannot integrate with it, who can buy or who can sell. Anybody can use it at any time, no matter what. Now, why is this all so important? Well, these are the very foundations that make up this new type of money and this new value that is replacing what is arguably a horribly messed up banking and financial system. Now, how does Digibyte fit into all of this? Digibyte is basically a faster, a better, and a stronger version of Bitcoin designed to overcome many of its shortcomings. Bitcoin is great, but you can't transact 8 billion people on 7 transactions per second which is what the limit of uh, Bitcoin is. So you see, the creator of Bitcoin did a really great job at a lot of things. Don't get me wrong. But due to the way that consensus works on Bitcoin, getting everybody to agree that the network should be able to handle more transactions by fixing or by scaling up the network with whatever method is incredibly difficult. Miners basically control that for the most part. And if they decide that the miners themselves want to make more fees, by keeping the transaction capacity lower and thereby making you bid uh, to get your transaction in faster, then that's effectively what's going to happen. Now you see, Digibyte fixes this by not allowing any one single group or any one collection of miners the ability to control this. The growth in capacity has already been written into the code, not to mention the fact that Digibyte uses five different mining algorithms to also help prevent domination by any single group. Although we can go into that a little bit later on if time permits. So Bitcoin, it seems to be very much establishing itself as more of a, a reserve currency with other things such as Litecoin or Vertcoin or Digibyte and many others hoping to take the reins as a more spendable kind of a currency. However, to be honest, I'm not entirely sure that Litecoin at only 56 transactions per second is going to win any awards in that respect either. So you see, Digibyte currently handles 560 transactions per second, first Bitcoin's seven, which amongst other things is where this value proposition starts to come in. Now this capacity doubles every two years, with it going over 1,000 by 2019, and eventually it will reach all the way up to 280,000. Now, there, one of the reasons there was a big debate in the middle of 2017 uh, about how best to handle Bitcoin scaling was because Bitcoin was so decentralized. Now, part of the problem with increasing the transaction per second capacity is that this is obviously going to use more hard drive space because you keep a record of every transaction that has ever occurred. So over time, it's going to build up. Uh, but this is also going to mean that over time, the amount of people who can keep a, a complete copy of the Bitcoin blockchain will severely decrease due to the rising requirements of hard drive space. The thing is, anybody is able to participate and download a copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. Everyone is completely equal. Nobody is greater than any other or trusted more or ranked higher. You see, you can come and go at any time, just as you please, with no having to ask permission from anybody. Now, you can be a computer geek, such as myself, who has a small server farm in the closet. Or you could be completely clueless about what you're doing, but still download the entire Bitcoin blockchain. Anybody can do it young or old, techno-savvy or not. Now, so as I mentioned, the miners seemingly wanted to keep Bitcoin as it is now and basically allow something else to rise up and effectively to complement the Bitcoin uh, protocol, the core protocol. Uh, now, this could be an off-chain solution, which I'm personally against uh, for a few reasons, which I can go into another time. Uh, this could also be another blockchain entirely. So 
I also agree with the Bitcoin miners on this though, that I don't see this as a winner takes all scenario. I think there is certainly more than enough of the crypto pie to go around for everybody. Uh, but anyway, back to the decentralized nature of Bitcoin. It was this decentralization or the lack of any one single point of authority uh, that basically meant that there was no agreement on how to proceed and make Bitcoin to scale up and handle more capacity. And so the status quo remained. Now, actually, this is a really good thing. It basically means that more people were fine with the way that it is, and so the majority ruled. This is the system working exactly as it should, preventing a vocal minority from coming along and changing things that they shouldn't really change. They effectively get voted out. Now, the same thing would happen if a government were to come along and try and manipulate the maximum supply. Let's say they wanted to increase it from 21 million up to 22 million. The remaining parties would all basically reject the notion, and it wouldn't pass. So Bitcoin and most other blockchains that, the, uh, that are based off the Bitcoin code, such as Vertcoin, Litecoin, Digibyte, they all share the same sort of permissionless and decentralized way of life. Now this is incredibly, incredibly important compared to what we have now with our existing banking system. So I've talked about uh, WikiLeaks and about how nobody can censor Bitcoin and stop you from making a transaction. I've talked about government and hyperinflation, how nobody can change the maximum supply of a Bitcoin. I've talked about anybody being able to participate, and hence the concern over the hard drive space usage of the blockchain in order to keep it so that as many people can participate as possible. I've also talked about how nobody can tell you what to do with your currency. I've talked about how you don't have to trust any single person at all. And I've also talked about how there's no middleman like a bank required at any time. And finally, I've talked about nobody being able to kick you off the network and nobody can stop you from using it, ever. Now, all of these things, in my opinion, are seemingly going down the gurgler as new people jump on board in the pursuit of overnight riches. You see, it's easier to explain to somebody, this crypto thing is just like what we've got now, only it's faster and better. Rather than having to explain to somebody, this crypto thing is a total change in mindset. It puts you in complete control of your own funds under nobody else's authority. Now the reason that you can't explain it that way is because not all blockchains are created equally. Not all cryptocurrencies are the same, nor do they all focus on the same thing. Some of them have different priorities. In fact, we've seen uh, some outright total scams come along, such as BitConnect. If you look back at it now, you think, man, that was so obvious it was a scam, and we were being lied to. But at the time, people were taking out uh, loans on their houses on a Ponzi scheme that very quickly unraveled. The same thing could be said for other cryptocurrencies. And although some of them are coming out with great ideas like we're buying a bank or we're going to be used by banks for international transfers, this doesn't mean that you should immediately think to yourself, hmm, banks, banks, I know how banks work. That sounds like a great idea. Here, take my hard-earned money. Unfortunately, where there's money to be made and being an early adopter in a world-changing shift in how money is handled, there is also people who in trying to take your hard-earned money from you. So you need to protect yourself and you need to be skeptical of everything. Now I'm going to pick a little bit on XRP here as a bit of an example of centralized versus decentralized, of permissioned versus permissionless. Now XRP was created by the company Ripple. They created all 100 billion of their tokens, all immediately. There was originally no real difference between XRP the token and Ripple the company. So much so that the token was originally called Ripple to begin with, and their core software is called Ripple D or Ripple Daemon, Ripple Server, uh, which you can still look up on GitHub. Now the story's changed a lot over time as more unsuspecting people have kind of fallen into the trap of thinking, this, this is the next big step in banking because it's going to be used by banks. Now this is because Ripple, the company, have created something known as XRAPID, and this is a method used of transacting value globally. It's supposed to be really fast and work anywhere in the world, just like Bitcoin, but the reality is though there's no specific need for XRP, the coin, in this instance, because other blockchains can be used by XRAPID. They don't though because Ripple, the company, control XRP, the coin, centrally. We've already discovered what happens when one entity controls a currency, or when they are there to pull the strings. I showed a graph about it earlier, even. You see, being permissionless is not a shade of grey. Either there's a superior, overarching party somewhere, 
who controls things and who must be trusted, or it's permissionless like Digibyte. Now, Ripple themselves, uh, the company, have been making strides since June this year to decentralize XRP, their coin. They've done this by changing the number of trusted servers that it runs on. You see, it was originally only a handful of servers uh, that it was run on that they completely owned themselves. It's now run on about 20, but of this, they own half of them, and the other half, they've authorized. If you compare this to Bitcoin, where the Bitcoin blockchain is on thousands and thousands of computers globally, and there's no overarching authority who can tell you or cannot tell you to run a server, who can say that you are trusted or not trusted. If you want to run a Bitcoin or a Digibyte wallet at home, you can. Nice and simple. You can keep a full copy of the blockchain, and that blockchain also gets shared with anybody and everybody else on the network. Now, this is a very stark contrast where Ripple controls the central list of authorized and of trusted servers. You've basically got a recipe for disaster. One central company controlling who is or who is not trusted. This sounds to me a lot like what happened with WikiLeaks, when they were decidedly no longer trusted, and Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, they all stopped processing their payments. Uh, many people would also argue, oh, but these servers, they're, they're run by third parties though, these extra servers for XRP. They're not actually run by Ripple themselves, that, that counts for something, right? Well, these people would sort of be correct, but they would also be wrong. You see, Ripple, the company themselves, have deemed these people to be trustworthy. Now, I would imagine that if these third parties don't toe the line, as it were, with the rules that Ripple make, or do as Ripple tell them, they'll get kicked off this trusted list. You see, you've got to do as Ripple say, or you're no longer part of that default list of trusted people. In addition, Ripple might trust these people, but does that mean that you should trust them? It reminds me a little bit of Scientology, where it's great when you're in the cool kids club and you're part of their inner circle, you're trusted. But if you step out of line when they ask you to do something, they'll effectively kick you out and throw you to the curb and find somebody else to replace you. So where Bitcoin and Digibyte offer all of these amazing technological breakthroughs and a break away from the traditional and failed banking methods, we have other blockchains that are coming along that would effectively, completely undo all of that hard work and progress. Again, this comes back to the fact that where there's money to be made and being an early adopter, as the value increases, there are people who are willing to effectively try their luck on anything that'll make them a quick buck. Compound this with the fact that a lot of people out there are just non-technical. They're basically entering what is arguably a more technical space than just, hi, I'd like to open a bank account and I'd like to have somebody look after my money. And so you have a space that is ripe for misinformation. You see, we've all seen this rampant tribalism that occurs with my coin is better than your coin and my coin is the only coin and here's why. You see, people get very emotional about their investments. Nobody wants to be told, actually, you gave your money to a scam. You need to get it the hell out of here. But that's what happened with BitConnect. And what's this, this latest one that I've seen the last few days? Initiative Q. It's a Ponzi scheme. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Ripple is a scam like other 75% pre-mined, proof-of-stake-backed coins. I'm more saying XRP is pointless. You see, XRapid could use many other blockchains, as Ripple themselves, the company, have stated. And the users of XRP are misunderstanding this whole entire point of a blockchain, of being trustless and being permissionless. Remember, that's the beauty of anybody being able to spin up a Bitcoin or a Digibyte node, a wallet and to contribute to the security of the network. That is a, such a change away from the p traditional trusted banking methods. We've made such great progress over the last nine years. Let's not go and undo this all now in search of a quick buck. Do we want to keep our existing banking system? Or do we want to embrace this new future where you are in direct control of your funds, where nobody can censor your transaction, where you can pay anybody around the globe in seconds, where a government or a company can't hyperinflate the value. I know which one I'm choosing. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll tune in for some more of these soon.